Out of all of the minority groups in our country, Blacks are the ones having no language of their own. We were strictly severed at the root. We couldn't even bring our bags. But think about this. We are considered to be African American regardless of whether we are the direct descendants of kidnapped Africans that landed in America. I am American as much as some of my closest and dearest friends are white. But my language is absolutely connected to my soul. It couldn't be severed or forgotten. You see, if you study language, you learn how language serves to insulate groups and protect them from outsiders. As a black man, as a black person that struggles with my lost history, I revel in the fact that my ancestors speak to me through soul. They teach me because soul is the nexus to my people, past and present. Soul is my identity, I'm born with it. Soul insulates me from those that can't speak my language as rhythm serves as my native tongue. With rhythm, I feed my family and I find education through sound. I also use it as a medium to discuss injustice and inequity, freedom and posterity, love and art. I use music to communicate my thoughts as music is the universal language, but soul is my own vernacular. It's special. And when I think about my thoughts, I often wonder why my language is viewed as urban or marginal. Because when others try to use it, the language is now considered pop or genius. Is this message different when the messenger is of a different color? If the messenger is a woman? What happens when the messenger is queer or undecided or decidedly not giving a damn about what you think? I say this all to say that the inhibition of speech creates ideological boundaries that affect us greatly. So we gotta talk, be open about our confounding principles and objectives because it's much easier to subjugate our values consciousness and well-being once we are restricted from speaking our minds. It's the reason I speak, but as a speaker, or as it pertains to this discussion, as a linguist, I'm inspired by artists that sound off with unfettered discretion, people that are real and use their platform for change. Because no one has to do this, it's a choice. Now my next guest made that choice a long time ago. She's a trailblazer that holds a venerable position in the music industry. She is what we all want to be. This Grammy award-winning individual is an artist's artist, a multi-instrumentalist, producer, composer, writer, speaker, and intellectual that is greatly admired around the world. Her career actually spans decades, and she still makes really, really, really good music. Please welcome the undeniably talented icon, Michelle Indigeo Cello. How are you? I'm so, I feel really good now. Thank you. I, uh, that made my morning. I was, <laughs> I, was I was wondering about myself if, as I worked on a score. What was I doing with my life? You made it sound really good. <laughs> oh, no, you are special. I mean, it's funny, you know, uh, you are somebody. You are somebody very unique. You, uh, you've done so much and you're doing so much and your voice carries so much, so much weight. I remember, I remember in 99 when, first of all, when I was, when I was young, when I was in elementary school, I remember telling my mom, hey mom, I want to get dreads. <laughs> nah, you ain't getting no dreads. Nah. <laughs> I was like, mom, yo, like what the hell? Like, yeah. let me get my dreads. And then I remember one day in 99, I said, I'm twisting my hair up. And the song that was in my head was like, <laughs> you know what song I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. So let me run 
my fingers through your dreadlock. It's the illest, the illest. And oh. that was the song that played in my head every time I walked up into the club, every time I DJed. Every time I actually spun your record, I had I had the LP and I'd always spin your record. And and I dropped that song because it's such a classic. But but the ladies didn't really understand that I was trying to get them to like think about spinning, you know, running their fingers through my <laughs> dreadlocks. And I had dreadlocks for 14 years, you know. But I want to thank you for giving us that wow. amongst so much other things. You know what thank I'm saying? You. I appreciate that. <laughs> how are you doing how are I'm you doing great. today i'm really good uh um i feel very blessed today i mean another day to try to wake up and have this experience i was looking forward to talking to you i'm yeah. really inspired by your career as, as well oh, and wow. also your, your way of thinking and you. how you engage with music in sort of a in, a in a very critical and analytical fashion but at the same time, it's 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 quite one of my favorite recordings of yours is uh, 12 Ways to Die." Oh and wow! I just Damn. and also, you know, I love concepts, and I just yes. want that's say that to you too. You 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 inspire me greatly. Wow, I mean that that's that's mutual, and and what's crazy is that, you know, when I always listen to your music, I never really went behind the music. I didn't realize how much similarity we actually had from a production standpoint until um, Ali Shaheed, you know, our mutual friend, yeah. was telling me about everything that you do. Because, you know, there's not a lot of people that play a myriad of instruments and could produce their own records and all that stuff, you know. But, but when I talk about somebody of that caliber, people never ever think about a woman as being that kind of person. Oh, uh, yeah, I appreciate you saying that. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, things are changing right now. I mean, I, I think we once spoke about, we, we, there are all these gazes, and I think it's just, um, I don't know if you have children. Do you have children? Two. I have, I have two daughters, 16 and 7. Oh, you are a very blessed man. Yes. Um, it's all about exposure. So, And I think we're moving into a time where there, there are so many amazing uh Produces that are of the female gender. Um, yes, I'm, I'm. I'm hoping that that's not. That's just regular now. That's just. Accepted. It has to be. Yeah. It has to be. You know, we we gotta knock down the gates and um, you know just change the minds. It's 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 funny because my 16 year old was talking to me the other day about this guy that likes her, mm -hmm. and uh, she was like, but. You know, Daddy, I don't know. I was like, "Why? Wow, what's up? She's like, well, you know, I asked him what kind of music he's into. And, you know, he said he's into like old school hip hop and all that stuff. And then when I asked him about Tribe and Farside and all that stuff, he don't know what I'm talking about. I'm like, yo, her, her name's Tamika. I'm like, yo, Tamika, you was raised in a record store. You was raised around all these people. You can't like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like, you got to like make sure that, you know, you're taking other people's into consideration as far as how they're raised. But I say this all to say, I'm so proud that my daughter is so musically inclined and seeing things from that vantage point instead of having to have some dude tell her about music, yes. you know what I'm saying? So it's that's that's a beautiful thing, you know. Yeah, but well, um, and, that, and that young brother is blessed to be in her company, and yes. hopefully he will be wise enough to, you know, take in some new foundational information. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, yo, there's so much things I want to talk to you about. I feel like I have to have like a five part interview with you, but oh, no, I want to, I want to just get into this first question. Um, you know, as a black man. I'm very interested to hear how you define the concept of of feminism. Like, what is what does feminism actually mean to you? <laughs> well, you you I thought you were going to read that long quote because I I must admit I, I I did say that and I think it's quite interesting. Well, let uh, me let me read that quote. Let me okay. let me let me let me get up in that quote. So you said, hold on, uh, so. You have this song, If That's Your Boyfriend, He Wasn't Last Night, which I love. Um, <laughs> I love. And it, so in response to the criticism, 
Mm -hmm. because you were getting criticism from that. You oh. told the LA Times in 94, yeah. I'm not a feminist, not at all. Feminism is a white concept for white middle-class women who want to have the same opportunities as their white male counterparts. We can fight our men or we can fight the system. I'm not going to fight my brothers. I'm going to try to stand beside them. I try to support my brothers on many terms. I cannot talk bad about them. I refuse. I refuse to. I just hope they turn around and give me the same respect. That's all. A lot of women take issue with what I have to say. To me, an issue is all the women, black and white, who are on welfare. To me, an issue is incorporating the men who are in control of the patriarchy into how we feel. If we separate them, they'll never know. I, yeah, I think so. I, I, wow, I was like, that's pretty clear. And, and the note I took that I wanted to tell you is, um, you know, that's third wave feminism. Um, and I'd been introduced to that um, in terms of intersectionality, sex positivity, mm -hmm. vegetarianism, mm -hmm. eco-friendly mm -hmm. thoughts, mm -hmm. ideas that are very prominent at this moment. But mm -hmm. I also understand as we continue to grow as people, there are a few things I would adjust how I said them. Okay. Uh, as time has changed and that as feminism continues to ebb and flow and change foundations and come out of different mouths, it will feel differently to your daughters and their daughters. Mm -hmm. um, but at, at 52, I want to say now understanding what I understand now, and I have two sons, I, I, I stand behind that because um, they, I really feel pitted against men sometimes, but also as someone who is visually androgynous, even though I, much, I very much feel two-spirited, I, I feel I have an interesting perspective to the position, but being, feeling at times able to understand the generalizations made about femininity and about masculine roles. So that's, I, 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 I just wanted to say like in 2021, those are the least of our issues. And I just, I'm so happy that I'm seeing people of color, all, all color just coming together to be united in humanism. And that even this feminist topic is a distraction to some much larger issues. <laughs> Well, you know, it's interesting that you say that um, because as, as, as a man, right, if, if, if I hear the word feminism, society stigmatizes me to think that it's like anti-man, where like the general concept of feminism is not that, you know, the general it's concept is, yeah. right, it, it is ever-changing, but but, you know, if we had to create just a simple explanation, it's really like the advocacy of women's rights on the basis of political, economic and social equality, um, you know, essentially boils down to ending gender discrimination. That's, you know, on this basic, basic level. Right. But the reason I really wanted to get into yeah. <laughs> this topic with you, right, is because there's a lot of history behind the concept of feminism and like you said, the, the notion of intersectionality, right? So I wanted to just kind of um, give the, the, the listeners some history on this concept. So uh, feminism is not uniquely female, first of all, you know, as both men and women can advocate, should advocate for yes. the equality of women. Yes. Many don't know this, but Frederick Douglass was a big supporter, yes. you know, for female empowerment. So the question I want to pose is, is feminism uniquely female in a homogenous sense, meaning there is no intersectionality cons to consider here? So before we answer this question, like I said, I want to go into some history. So I'll start with a very controversial concept. What if I said that feminism is often considered white supremacy in heels? <laughs> so let's just, let's, let's just hold on. Hold on to that for a second and let's build on it. So, so advocates of this side, this perspective, find similarities in the women's suffrage movement in particular. So let's go back. <laughs> yeah. Like during the antebellum days, you know, civil, uh, pre-Civil War, white women were essential in aiding the abolitionist movement 
White women found their lives somewhat parallel to that of black men and women because they were also denied the right to education, suffrage, a myriad of property rights, and really anything outside of domesticated activities. The empathy and help of white women undeniably fueled the abolitionist movement, but there was a catch. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, so when we, when we talk about feminists like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, yep. um, I remember learning about them in, in high school extensively, right? They supported the movement and were positive that once the North won the Civil War and the enslaved people were granted the right to vote, women would also be re rewarded for their war efforts and, and, and support with commensurate suffrage. But what happened? The 15th Amendment was proposed, which would read, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Hence, there's nothing about gender mentioned in that constitutional amendment. So, black female suffragists and Frederick Douglass, who had once enjoyed the friendship and camaraderie of these white Suffragists such as Stanton and Anthony mm -hmm. felt betrayed when the white feminists opposed the passage of the 15th Amendment, which would give black men, not women, the right to vote. The 15th Amendment passed and there was a new division in the feminist movement. Now, I, I, I bring this up because what I'm trying to do is paint the picture of intersectionality within feminism, right? So a black feminist, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper said, white women needed suffrage for education, but black women need the vote, not as a form of education, but as a form of protection, okay? Yeah. As a form of protection. So we all knew what they had to be protected from. Now, she also said that when it was a question of race, I let the lesser question of sex go, but the white women all go for sex, letting race occupy a minor position, like our textbooks. So, you know, my question is whether this dichotomy exists in today's movement. And this leads me towards the question of, like I said, intersectionality and whether certain aspects of feminism can be homogenized or not. Is it okay to be a black feminist as black women face a myriad of injustices that other races do not encounter? So with black feminism, feminism from the standpoint of double oppression, right? I, I yeah, I, I mean, this is, this is an interesting topic and it comes up in conversations or in other interviews I have. And it's not that I have a stock answer. Yeah. It's just, you started the show about language, and that language doesn't work for me. And mm. historically, I completely understand it. Mm -hmm. But uh, my other note was, as ideas take hold in the mo ideas take hold in a moment in time, but mm -hmm. ideas continue to evolve as I continue to live, and I'm able to see gender roles morphing and innovations and experiments in body enhancement technology. I want for my brother and my sister what I want for myself, which is ease of mind, safety of both body and mind, and a place for nourishing thoughts, entertainment, and communing with one another for our physical and spiritual needs. I'm trying to change the language because I just, I'm going through this thing right now where uh, one of the later questions you asked me concerning Baldwin, and I guess it's, it's taken me a long time to release myself from the canon. One day I woke up and I realized most of, most of the theory and history I know ha has been sort of instilled upon me by, by educators in a certain way. And now as I'm starting to seek out other information to sort of free other parts of my mind, I am struggling with the language uh, of feminism. And so I think I'm starting to let it go for myself personally. And I'm trying to create a community, especially as a musician. I feel like I'm, it's such a special fellowship to be a musician. It transcends gender and 
all these other things. We're coming together to create something viably uplifting and, and fortifying or thought provoking. And with that, I must take myself out of that conversation personally. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's beautiful. I mean, because we all really, you know, when I say, when, 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 when we're talking about blackness and we're talking about black power, when we're talking about the power of women, when we're talking about the concept of feminism, what we're really talking about is egalitarianism, where we're all looking to live under natural law and be free. Whew. We're all looking to respect one another, you know? And what people on the other side don't realize when we say Black Lives Matter is that we're really saying, see, I hate saying this. Yeah. I hate saying this. <laughs> but we're really just saying, all, we're really saying all lives matter. Don't forget about us. You know what I'm saying? And like, it's, it's, it's just deep because we have to choose methods. We have to choose varying approaches. We choose music. Yeah. We choose speaking. We choose writing essays. But like we break down why there are inequities when the other side chooses to be complacent when these things are happening to us. And delusional. You know? I mean, that's that's why Baldwin's important to me. That, that when he explained that slavery and all the other American atrocities, that's not the crime. The crime is your inability to acknowledge your position in the crime <laughs> and the effect of your crime. And yes. that's what I'm I, like earlier in your introduction. You 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 said struggle. I believe you. Yes. You know, it's the hit. It's. I mean, not to. We should be having fun and, and having a lighthearted discussion. But I must admit, last year and a couple of years before, it's just been really hard to reckon with history the way we're having to now. And it is heavy. It, it weighs heavy on my mind a lot. I mean, do you know <laughs> any other minorities that don't feel that way? You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, I, I always I always tell people that, you have to understand what happened and you have to understand how the past put us in the position that we are in now. But at the same time, you have to live life without harboring a dead soul. Because yes. I have friends that are so wrapped up in injustice that they can't see the beauty of life. Oh, you know what I'm saying? So you have to be able to have that balance so that the nefarious goals of others, <laughs> their malice isn't yeah. bringing you down so that you can live your life for your, for your friends, family, for your children, all that, you know? Yes, Mr. Young, you are, yes. <laughs> you know, and, and like, I, I was really excited to talk to you about this topic because I don't, I don't really get the chance to, to have these kind of, conversations because these conversations make me think about things. I never really spent time thinking about the intersectionality. And, and for those out there that don't understand what we mean when we say intersectionality, where we're talking about you're analyzing the circumstances based on identifying two sides and you are synthesizing those two sides and looking at how the nexus aggravates the result of the two, right? So like being a woman, you're already marginalized, but then now if you're a black woman, that's a whole nother identity and you're putting those together and you're seeing how those come together to, to further ag aggregate inequities. But thinking about this subject, I, you know, I always think about my mother right <laughs> my mother is a black woman when we are discussing the concept of feminism does the concept of feminism take in to consideration the black mother 
of a young black man. You had your first child when you were 19, right? Yes. Yes. Solomon, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So that's a whole different vantage point. Oh, yeah, that I was unaware of. I mean, to be honest, uh, you know, I was very, like, a, very nervous to be on here, but also excited to have these conversations. But yeah. I am an autodidactic. My mother was a domestic. Um, she was, uh, had a fourth grade education. I taught my mother how to read. Wow. Um, my mother's from Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. And a few of the stories I got her to tell, you know, we're, I'm very aware of the plantation I come from. Uh, definitely tobacco, Philip Morris. And it's one of the reasons, you know, when I was young and I'd smoke cigarettes and someone really hit me to <laughs> how I was just continuing this cycle that I didn't even really understand. And so I look at my mother and I have to have immense empathy for her. And my mother was mixed race as well. Right. And I have to have a complete utter empathy because what she had to share with me was very limited. And she was very broken, just a broken person. And my father um, was joined the military for, he joined for reasons he didn't want to. He had an opportunity to go to college, but my mother said was pregnant. And so he forsake that opportunity, which I think added to a lot of his frustration and anger. At the, at the end of the day, we're all humans. But the other thing that weighs heavy on me is not just the feminism, but that these two people who made he other human beings had a very limited understanding of their place in history. I don't think I don't. My father was a Republican in a weird way. Uh, he really had a certain way of thinking. And like I said, my mother was limited. So these ideas and concepts that we talk about came to me much later in life. And that's why I'm still able to detach myself from them because I know they are just concepts. Does feminism aid in like aiding me? Yes. And in a way, I'm glad there's Planned Parenthood where I could go get checkups. I'm, 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 I'm glad feminism has made it easier for other young women to deal with their, you know, contraception issues. Yes, it does. But it's still... Well, I don't know. There's, it doesn't reach the people that it's really supposed to help, I guess, to me. Is it truly reaching in terms of those who are autodidactic, but they're more concerned about, you know, things that we may not understand? So that's, that's why I have this position. You no, know, I, I totally get it. And um, again, language, right? Right, because because having my two daughters, I remember the day that Trump got elected, right, or the day that the results came in. I remember being with my two kids and saying, "Look, you can be president. I want you to look at this, and I want you to believe that you can be president." And for all those people that talk shit about when Obama became president, I said, look, you can say whatever you want. But I remember so many people, so many of my friends saying that they couldn't do anything because a black person would never be president. So just him becoming president gave energy to vibrations that changed, that, that, that is helping our world to evolve. And I always want to empower any woman I mean, people in general, but more so women, because they don't get the opportunities that us men get. And, and I can't stand that. I really can't stand that, you know. Um, and, you know, that's why, you know, someone like you, you've been, don't take this in the wrong way, but you, you know, since the start of your career, you were so intelligent, right? Like concepts you were discussing back then are 
concepts that you start to learn as you get older, but you were talking about this stuff back then. When you were talking about this stuff, I didn't fully understand it, <laughs> but you were opening my mind up. I'm 42. I've turned 43 in what, a week or something. But oh, it's going to call me 43. <laughs> thanks. thanks. But yeah. thank you. But like, I, I, want, let's, I want to use this to go into plantation lullabies. Okay. What's crazy is right before we did this, right before we started this podcast right here, yeah. somebody walked into my record store. My studio is connected to my record store, right? Okay. And I can't wait for you to come to LA yeah. to see it. But it's called the R Form Studio. So I get a text from a front saying, yo, one of your friends are here. I'm like, yeah, I'm about to oh. do a podcast with Michelle right now. I can't. And then it was Mahershala Ali. Oh. <laughs> so so I went out there and I'm like, bro, I'm about to do a podcast with Michelle. He's like, oh, tell her I said what up. I know that you worked with his wife. and oh, um, yeah. <laughs> But we, we had one hell of a discussion about plantation lullabies. And he was talking about how his father bought him the album. And I'm like, yo, dude, I used to play that album all the time. We were just building. And we were building. And I was like, all right, man, we'll continue this conversation. I got to cut you off right quick. But that's my segue into this. Oh. You know, you, you spoke so deeply on this album. Um, you know, did you feel the freedom to use your own voice, first of all, because this was on this was on Madonna's Maverick label, correct? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. So so did you feel because you talked a lot of shit, did you feel the freedom to use your own voice on this <laughs> on, on this album? Oh, okay. Well, if, yes. And I think it was out of I was extremely naive. And they were a, a, a brand new company. So there were, I think, five employees. And uh, mm -hmm. so I had a lot of freedom. Mm -hmm. um, I must say, uh, I was, I had did a whole dance with Warner Brothers, Paisley Park, and Benny, Benny Medina, he, he was advising me at the time. And he, he was like, you should try the new label. You know, at least you'll get to be free and, and express your creativity. Um, and so I got to work with Andre Betts, um, mm. who produced If That's Your Boyfriend and a, mm. a lot of hits uh, from Madonna. I got to work with uh, David Gamson, who fronted Sc Scritti Politti, who I'm a huge fan of, and mm. uh, Mick Murphy from The System, who produced uh, Let Me Run My Fingers Through Your Dreadlocks. And it was just like I had fun. It was my dream come true. I grew up listening to, you know, Jeff Lauber, the, um, Stanley Turrentine, all kind of strange, you know, yeah. improvisational music. And I loved Prince. And this was just the experience of a lifetime to be in the studio and, and be able to do what I wanted to do, you know? I mean, I feel like one conversation I don't hear you a part of is just the the evolution of jazz and hip hop. You know, I don't know why I don't hear you as being part of that discussion. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like if you, anybody that listened to your album right now, be like, oh, damn, she was up on that at the, then, back then. You oh, know yeah. what I'm saying? I was in Brooklyn and um, I, Mark Batson, do you know Mark Batson? I don't know Mark. Oh, amazing producer from Brooklyn. Um, I met him. And he like changed my world. He introduced me to DJ Red Alert, and I would just mm. listen to that to him all night long. I listened to the radio, um, just un until my mind couldn't take it. And growing up with go-go music, there would be these moments where the hip hop artists from New York would come down and perform with the go-go artists. So uh, I would see Dougie Fresh. Mm. <laughs> um, Early on, I'd seen Tribe Called Quest, I would, um, Jungle Brothers, and there was just something magical about the construction of the music. I, I envy and admire and praise all those individuals who hear two beats of a bar or six beats of a, a bar and, and can loop it and create these brand new creations. Mm -hmm. And that just was mind blowing to me. I went and got an MPC 60. Plantation mm. Lullabies is mostly made on that in the SP-12. I could Damn. play music, but I was definitely fascinated by structuring music in this this way, in that form, you know? Mm. I mean, I mean, it was it's straight jazz. It's jazz <laughs> funk, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I, I love that resurgence of 90, in the 90s of, of the funk, you know? 
Um, it like incognito, it takes you back to listen to, you know what I'm saying? Like all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I just love it. And I like the nineties because Young sampling, ch- yes, yeah. s- sampling changes sound, but then now you using live instruments, using the vantage point of hip hop to make something funky and bigger. You know, I, I just, I just love it. And, and going through that album again after years, just, just made me so happy. But then going into your second album, uh, Peace Beyond Passion, you know, you created a very captivating story that was censored, and that's Leviticus Faggot. Mm-hmm. Talk to me about the meaning of this song, and then let's get into the, like, talk about the video. So tell the audience the meaning of the song. Oh, um, my mother was extremely religious. I mean, I, I definitely cut my teeth playing in a lot of gospel bands. I grew up in the church. It's mm-hmm. very, something I'm very connected to. But it was very hard uh, because of the dogma. And I think after the first record, I don't think people understand, like you have your whole lifetime to make your first record. It's your Mm -hmm. whole life. And then you get this opportunity and you spill your guts. Second record changed my life in the sense of, I left DC, I lived in New York. And then I remember going to California to, 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 to make a recording. And I ended up living there because I was like, if this is the ghetto and there's palm trees and I can drive to the beach, I'd much rather be poor here. I'd rather mm. like make my life in this kind of vibe. Um, but while I was there, I remember traveling back to DC and um, I was with a person I was involved with and I was challenged by someone. They wanted to treat me like I was a man and fight. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, I was hurt, you know, physically, and it just stuck with me. And then I think a week later, I lost a friend mm. to a, you know, just a hate crime. And that's what inspired wow. this because I, I, I in no way equate, you know, <laughs> um, my choices of who I love to race, but there are some, some points where they intersect and it's really hard to understand how you could hate someone or feel such hate for someone who's different to you than you, that you would take their life or you could disagree with someone's life and you would put your own child out the house. And so that's what the song is. It's, it's a combination of those two Two questions, you know. Yeah, and I watched the video. I never saw the video before, man. Oh. And that it's like it's so deep, and <laughs> you know, it 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 hit me, it hit me in a special way because, just like you said, so the song is about, uh, hate uh, uh, yeah. uh yes, yeah, it's, it's about <laughs> hate crime, but like a a a a, a, a boy or a man that. It's homosexual or bisexual, and pops can't take it. Get out no. the house. Mom's really, you know. And then when I saw this video, I read that a part was omitted when it was played on mm-hmm. MTV, with the, with, yeah. which is a suicide at the end yeah, with yeah, the razor yeah. blade, right? Yep. So two things I got from this video, from this song. Tell me, tell well, me. One, one is that if any of my daughters would say that they are bi or gay or whatever, yeah. I'm going to give them a hug. <laughs> of course. <laughs> because they're op- they, they feel open enough with me to tell me something like that. And it's like uh, my, my children, this may make no sense to a lot of people, but I say this, I'm dead serious. <laughs> Yes. My children are raised on RuPaul Drag Race. Yes. I'm dead serious. <laughs> We've seen <laughs> every it is. We've seen every every season including all the All-Stars. And one of the main reasons why is because it's a very intelligent it's a very intelligent show from fashion to perspective. Yes. But one thing that RuPaul talks about is finding your tribe and be okay with being yourself. So my six-year-old 
my or my seven year old, I mean, and my sixteen year old, like we watch it as a family and we love it, love it, love it, love it, and I and I and I and I love to see them watch it and understand that you can make a choice as far as whoever you want to love, right? Secondly, I had a cousin my age. He's like my favorite cousin. <laughs> and he wasn't accepted by his dad. No. And I see we see each other at family reunions and I didn't see him for a while. And then I saw him and it was good to see him. It was like after years, you know, I, I saw him. I was about, probably about 19. Mm -hmm. And that was the last time I saw him because he oh. jumped off a 16-story building to commit suicide. Yeah. And my family is Caribbean from Guyana. So, you know, you, oh. all that machismo. Mm -hmm. And I saw his father, who's my uncle, who I, I love to death, become totally crushed because he saw how that changed the life of the son that he loved. So when I watched your video, it reminded me of my favorite cousin that's no longer here with us. And, yeah. you know, it's, I, I just hate the fact that ignorance places people in the position where they can't accept others for who they are because why should it matter if I like a guy Oh, Adrian, or if you like you know, a woman? Why? Oh, you know why. Oh, um, I mean, it just it depends on, again, time, situation. Um, it, it's maybe a sign of weakness. You know, femininity in a man is a sign of weakness. Um, why does it matter? I don't know. I ask myself that too. And I, I mean, we are, we've been inundated to sort of rid ourselves of anything that makes us uncomfortable. I wish my mother would have worried more about what kind of person I was instead of who I loved. But these things, I think with parents are, they see it as a reflection as of something they've done wrong. I also have to say I blame Hollywood in the sense of people's personal lives should not be up for fodder. I mean, it's it's just what I do, pers what anyone does personally should be their own business. To me, it is the, it's just a, I mean, we have to look at our, the effects of Christianity on, 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 on society, I think. I mean... I mean, come on, you know, the, just the effects of, or I, you know, I say this as somebody that's a Christian, the the uh, the effect of organized religion, like, yo, I just, you know, I'm all about everybody having their religious beliefs, but let other people live their life, you know? I mean, slavery evolved to a whole nother level for avaricious reasons and the Catholic church supported it big time. Right. You know, so I don't know. I just, when I, when I think about people struggling daily to be themselves, it all falls in the cavernous pit of identity and understanding who you are right because every day is a public performance every day we make choices the way we speak the way we dress the way we walk the way we use our language it's all identity but we are novel unique and we are all the same at the same time and Something else I wanted to talk to you about. There's so much I want to talk to you about. I love talking to you. Um, yeah. But um, tell me, tell me. I want to. I want to go into your. I want to jump all the way into your NPR performance. Oh, okay. Oh, that was, that was so uh, 
beautiful. The NPR Tiny Desk. If y'all listening, I need you right after this to watch NPR Tiny Desk with Michelle. Uh, you're so kind. I, I, I have to be honest with you. I did mm. not enjoy that. That was not fun. And that was the very first time I played music after not playing music for over a year in the pandemic. Mm. I had just been scoring. And so it was cathartic in a way. But in mm. a way, it was like, wow, it's weird to have no audience or no interaction. It was very strange. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you, you have a perpetual audience because they could watch that every day. I was watching that and I was just, because you were going back to Plantation Lullabies and then you did this song. Uh, it was uh, what? What The I Price of the Ticket. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just walking, trying to get home. I ain't mm. doing nothing. Just leave me alone. Lord, give me wings to fly before they shoot me down and I die. Don't let them shoot me down and I die. Put down your gun and take your hands off me, officer, officer, officer. I know you're afraid like me, but look at my hands. Please don't shoot me. And like your whole performance, it was like theater. It was deep. And I always tell people that as an artist, if you don't take yourself seriously, why would anybody else take yourself seriously? You did such a great job being yourself and telling your story and using this platform that brings millions of viewers to see you to tell your story, to use your language, your universal language, to inspire thought in others. That's special. And that's a choice. You know, like, with my... When I, when I watch this, I think about you know, my album, The American Negro, and, and I saw that you posted my cover and it got taken down. Yes. yes. And I, you know, and I appreciate you even supporting that. I mean, really? just wow. you, I sat you, with that record for a week. Oh my God. Wow. That, yeah. that, thank you. thank you. Means a, that you have no idea how much that means to me because you inspire me so much. And I, and I really, I really, really mean that, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we're both so inspired by people like James Baldwin. Um, but we have so much to say, and it's, I, I have admiration for you as a person, but then I times that by five <laughs> because you're a woman. Oh, I and, and like, you have handicaps that I don't because you're not expected and or allowed to do a lot of the things that I'm allowed to do even though I have my own handicaps yeah and you're not allowed to do a lot of things I'm allowed to do I'm so sorry that's, <laughs> that's true too right <laughs> yeah but the just the way you use your voice makes me think that it's time for us to definitely use our voice together, right? Oh, definitely. I you also know. wanted to say to you earlier, too. What's up? Um, I, uh, I spent a lot of time in Islam, too. It changed my life. Yes. And I, I, I mean, you know, I, I love all the ideas. I tr I'm definitely not an atheist I ever. Uh, I, I really am enchanted by the mystery. But there's one is Islamic story about better than, less than. Mm -hmm. And that was the that was the sin of of Lucifer, the one made of light. He was very mm -hmm. angry at those who were made of clay. How could mm -hmm. the creator love them more? And I must admit, um, that's what's propelling me now, get, re ridding myself of better than, less than. And and that's that's what's changing me. And that's the language I want to try to work in so that songs like The Price of the Ticket can can tell a story at the same time I'm not not being drowned by my fears and sorrows. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> no, that's beautiful. And that's one of the things uh, Mahershal and I were talking about regarding you because you're like, yo, you know, she's Muslim. I was like, yo, I did not. I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> and then, you know. Best. Not the best, but I, I do believe. I'm very, I feel very blessed by the things I've learned in that community. That's beautiful. That's yeah. beautiful. Um, well, you know, you've always been a rebel, someone that has always been ahead of your time. 
you still are, and I'm so grateful. You are, you're never afraid of controversy. You are special. When I think about myself, my own role as a human, a teacher, an artist, I realize that there's only one me. There will never be another me, ever. You know, and I look at the uniqueness, the novelty, and continued accomplishment of, of people like yourself in hopes that I can mirror that. You are dope, and I'm thankful. I appreciate all that you do. And I want to thank you for being part of Invisible Blackness. Oh, oh, I appreciate you and your mind and your mama and your daddy and your, your children. They should be very blessed to have someone who is engaged in the world in conversation, trying to better it for, for so many people. And I just want to tell you, I'm very, very grateful for your music and for having me here. And yes, I think you and I are about to make something interesting. Um, Absolutely. Because I do like the theater and I do think like, uh, yeah, you are, your concept of, 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 of creating scenarios. I, I really look forward to that opportunity. <laughs> This is Michelle and Dege Ocello, and you're listening to Invisible Blackness.